So we're continuing on our sermon series. We're uh, running through uh, Genesis uh, as you've, as we talked last year or last week. Yeah, last year, last week, uh, whatever it was we met. Uh, it was kind of the, esta- the establishment, the setting of the stage for telling the good gospel, right? Telling the story. So God clears the clears the land, gets everything ready, uh, puts puts the important players on the stage. Uh, we're going to continue. We're going to c- continue to see some uh, players placed down in on there. And really, what we're going to see here is we're going to see God blessing uh, uh, the man Adam, or uh, specifically and more and in a general sense, all of us. He's going to be blessing everybody with a whole level, of, a series of relationships. And really, this is this is where we establish the way things ought to be. So oftentimes, uh, people will seem dis- disappointed in life. Somebody will betray them. Uh, somebody will do something. And there will be that, that feeling or that, that hurt or that pain. Somebody will die. There will be a pain and there will be a, a, almost a cry inside that says, Hey, it ought not be like this. Well, the reason we have that is because it started out not being like this. So there's an idea that behind every relationship is this perfect idea that God created at the very beginning. We all have it. Uh, so he sets out, he establishes this. So every relationship is a gift. It's a, it's a spiritual gift that God gave. And he set it, he established it, he built it, and then, well, we've mucked it up a little bit. Uh, but thankfully, the, the story doesn't end uh, with them eating the fruit and then dropping dead, right? So after, you know, it doesn't end when I've just failed in my relationship. God doesn't just zap me. Uh, he creates a way for us to restart, restore, heal, uh, forgive. So that's where we're at. And if you'd like to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, that would be good. That's where we're going to be at. Um, I've divided this into kind of, uh, as we're going through these two plus cha- chapters, uh, we're kind of running, uh, we're going to be running relatively fast through them. But what I did is I, I divided it almost in storytelling. You see kind of the relationships as they're supposed to be. They're set up at the very beginning. So that's kind of act one. And then act two, all of a sudden, there's a little bit of a challenge. Oh, what's going to happen? Um, oh, man messes up, right? Things happen. Our relationships that were supposed to be beautiful, we messed up. And then we have the third act is God saying, hey, guess what? The story's not over. Uh, healing and, rec- and, and a promise for, for recovery. And then, of course, we have an epilogue here that shows that those kind of ripples are continuing on. But again, so is that promise of that hearing. So that's an overview of what we're going to do. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and launch right now to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, Act 1, I call it the gifts of our relationships. So if you'd open your Bibles, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plant nor uh, grain were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet set rain to water the earth. And there was no people to cultivate the, the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. And then the Lord God painted, or sorry, planted a garden in Eden in the east, and then he placed the man uh, he made there. That's what he did. He started it all up. Now, just a reminder, this is interactive, so if there's questions or anything, that we, you can always shout out the questions. Sound good? Just a reminder of the interactive nature of the services. All right, so we see here that God kind of creates the man. It's kind of a special thing, right? He does it in a way that he doesn't do anything else, and he breathes life into it. And um, in that ancient world, that breath is the idea of a spiritualness or a spirit. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is kind of that... Uh, that the same same kind of word, the same kind of idea of spirit or the breath of life. That's kind of what it is. So first of all, we see that when man was created, there was that spiritual element from the start. That's how we're designed. So uh, so man is, and they're a special creation, and you get that picture of an intimate relationship right off the bat. Uh, God relates with humanity in a way that he doesn't seem to relate with everything else in the story. So the director had everything else set out, and especially, but he specially created the man, and then he specially breathed into it that, that kind of that neat thing, that first relationship, the breath of life. Uh, so again, humanity was spirit-filled from the beginning. That's how we ought to be. 
Uh, continue to read on. The Lord God made all sorts of trees to grow in the ground, uh, trees that were both be uh, that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, He placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed through the land of Eden, watering the the garden and dividing it into four branches. The first branch was called the Pishon, uh, followed, uh, sorry, flowed around the entire land of uh, Hevela, uh, where gold is found. The, the gold of that land are, is exceptionally pure. Uh, aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. And the, the second branch is called the Gohan, or Gihon, uh, flowed around the entire land of Cush. The third branch, called the Tigris, uh, flowed east along the land of Asher, and the fourth branch was called uh, the Euphrates. Now, some of these places, we know where they're at. Some of these places, we don't have a, an idea of where they're at. Uh, but part of it is, is to give us an idea of we're kind of looking in that kind of, that sometimes people call it the Furrow Crescent, the Mediterranean, that kind of, or sorry, that, that little, that Middle Eastern thing. Um, and depending on what those other things are, it's, it's a little interesting. Uh, like I said, the boundaries that are here match very closely the boundaries of the Promised Land that you're going to see. So Tigris and Euphrates. So the, bottom, the, the boundaries of the Promised Land are Tigris and Euphrates and the River of Egypt. Well, the land of Cush is kind of like Ethiopia or Egypt. So you get an idea that you're looking at the same thing. Tigris and Euphrates. So, so you kind of got that idea that, that really God's setting this out. But I'll tell you this, that when he talks about the garden, he's talking about a smaller area within a larger area. It's not the whole area. Remember it says that in the east part of the garden, or sorry, in the east part of the land, he's setting up this little thing, right? He's, he's setting up this special place to meet with man. It's kind of like this holy and special place to meet man. Primarily because man, we have two feet. Could we have wandered all, all the way from Egypt all the way around to, uh, to, the, to the Mediterranean? Or, and from the Mediterranean all the way over to, uh, to the Tigris and Euphrates? Eventually, yes. Eventually. <laughs> but it's a little bit of a hard track, right? So if we want to meet God every day, it's good to know that we're going to be kind of in this little space, right? Now I'll tell you that this picture, this imagery of this Holy of Holies, is going to be continued, and it's going to continue on over and over again. Now, I'm going to get ahead a little bit. Um, how many of you have heard this story before? So you know Adam and Eve are going to get thrown out of the garden at some point, and the cherubim are set up in there. Well, I'll tell you that there's that picture over there where God kind of guards the Holy of Holies from unholy man. And several times throughout the Old Testament, as Abram's coming into the land, or as, as, as Jacob's coming into the land, or as Moses is getting ready to come over the land, one of the things is there's that idea of there's, there's God has this holy you know, angel that kind of separates. And as a matter of fact, it goes all the way up into the building of the temple. And the, and, and the whole idea of the Holy of Holies is this special place that, not, that people go to meet God, but they can't really go there because they're unholy, right? There's that... That barrier, and if they come in, approach the Holy of Holies, what's going to happen to them? Their, their sin is going to cause them to die. And that goes all the way up until the crucifixion. And then at the death of the cross, very significantly it says, and when Jesus died, what happens to the barrier? Do you remember what happens to the curtain that divides the Holy of Holies from the rest? Torn asunder. It's torn asunder. It's torn from the top to bottom. So you're going to see the end of the, the story of the Garden of Eden, of that kind of barrier, that, that thing, actually ends at the cross. So it starts here, and it echoes through. So we got, we're getting an idea of this holy, holy, this place to meet God is established. Continue to read on. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that fruit, then you will surely die. So right here is the dun dun dun, right? You get the idea, uh oh, I know what's going to happen. Even if you hadn't read the story before, all of a sudden the storyteller, Moses, is, has put down this in here, and you get the feeling you're like, come on, Adam, make the right choice, but I'm, it's too early in the story, right? Or we put ourselves in the story and go, eat. How many times does mom say, whatever you do, don't eat that apple pie? Suddenly everything is fixated on that apple pie. Or strawberry rumor pie that's waiting for Sunday, or whatever the deal is, you're like, it's just calling you. But the, the beauty is what also God's done in this is He's set up and He's established all these kind of right relationships.
for humanity. All of those oughts I said at the very beginning where we feel like things ought to be one way or, you know, it's, you know, all these things, it's all set up at the beginning. People are like, oh, you know, the, the water should be pure, the land should be great, or you know, people should be nice to each other. All of those right relationships between humanity and the world are established right here. As a matter of fact, even God is giving Adam a job, something to do. Something to spend his time with, tend and watch over the garden. Now, has Adam done anything to deserve this? Is it a punishment or is it a blessing? It's a blessing. Work, in this sense, is a blessing. As a matter of fact, God uses this even to sustain man. He's put, he's put trees in it, but he lets man do stuff so that the trees get... I mean, it's all kind of this whole thing for the man. So i got to tell you that this is one of those things that we, it would be good for us to look and realize that labor isn't necessarily... Well, it's not a four-letter word, right? Five-letter word. I almost said work. And then I was going to say work isn't a four-letter word, but then somebody would say, well, work is a four-letter word. So it went with labor. So. Work is? No, I'm sorry. Anyway. Um, now, I tell you, as Christians, it's important for us to look at labor in a biblical way. So, that, that means put it in a kind of a balanced approach. It's easy for us, first of all, to not like work because, because sometimes it's uncomfortable, right? So it would be easy for us, because it's uncomfortable for us, for us to say, well, work is bad, and that's not the case. Now, can work be bad? Absolutely. So it's not good and it's not bad. It depends with work or labor. Now, there are some of us that confuse busyness for holiness. So we can have an overly holy view of work. Because we're slaving away, then we must be doing good. Right? The reality is somewhere in between. God has a plan for us in our day. Now, I'll use me, not you. Because it's really easy for somebody, and I'll say, like me, to fall into this trap. But you're going to hear that not like me is probably like you. So, as a pastor, it's easy for me to say that every little bit of every day that I do is a job for Jesus, right? It's like I can name every hour and say, this hour... I'm doing this for Jesus. And this hour, I'm doing this for Jesus. And this hour, I'm doing this for Jesus. Well, there's a point where I can be so busy doing things for Jesus, I'm not really doing what Jesus wants me to do in the day. Does that make sense? A good sign that that's happening in your life is when you're really trying to work that 25th hour into a 24-hour day. Somewhere, and you look at your plan, and you look at your planner, day planner, and I'm like, no, I got Jesus labeled on all these. Well, you got busyness, and you're confusing busyness for Jesus. So the challenge is to take that moment and say, okay, God, what would you have me do today? I will tell you that there will be points in your life that what Jesus will want you to do will not look like what you think a ministry looks like. So many people think that the only ministry that happens in a church is here on Sunday where some knucklehead standing up at this pulpit talking. But the most important ministries that this church, this body of believers does, is when they're interacting with other human beings. That's the primary ministry. We give this place honor, but that's not the one. You know, very few people come to Jesus because Rick said something amazing. Long before they came, they come and make that profession, they, they come because the Holy Spirit is living out in you and showing them a different life than what they have. That could be done while you're changing somebody's oil. Cleaning their house. Making their sandwiches. So for us, it's kind of like turning around. Now, I'll tell you, those, those things that Adam was doing in the garden, those, those, that work, that was worship. In a sense, God set up, set up a, a system for him to do and function and all that, and it's all beautiful, and it's all perfect, and it's all great. 
Then the Lord said that it's not good. Well, wait, Rick, you just said everything was good, right? It's important right here. Look, this is an important verse. Uh, uh, Genesis 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. Now, so oftentimes we look at this and um, we miss the importance of it. Has Adam done anything wrong? To this point, no. Nothing. Matter of fact, God has created everything from the beginning up to this point, and he said deliberately when he created something, he says, and it's good, and it's good, and it's good, and it's good. This is the first thing in Genesis that is not good, and it's before sin enters the world. Isn't that interesting? Not really. Not really. It's, well, here's what it's saying. He is listening. Here's what it's saying. It is saying that not living, so sometimes, uh, sometimes it's bad for us not to do something good for us. I don't know. Let me, let me I'll, I'll say this. I know. Let me, let me back it up. No, please. We'll hit this way. Can Adam love God? If Adam's the only person on the planet, can he love God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength? Absolutely. If Adam doesn't have a neighbor, can he love his neighbor? No. So God has made Adam to be able to love other people. But are there other people for Adam to love? Not yet. He's standing there alone. He's like, I want to give somebody a hug. He's the only one on stage. Can you give anybody a hug? No, it won't work. Now, Adam hasn't done anything wrong, but he can't live up to the potential that God created for him. And sometimes when we think of sin, we think of sin as always doing evil, doing something nefarious. But sin is more than that. Sin is just not living the mark. God has created him with the capacity to love other humans, but there's no other humans. Now, I'll um, continue reading. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals uh, and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he called them. And the man uh, chose a name for each one of them, and he gave, uh, he called the names of all the livestock and all the birds in the sky and all the wild animals, but there was still no help, helper just right for him. So God's doing some amazing stuff here. First of all, there's a couple big points that I want to point out. The first one is that the need for a relationship was something that was designed in, in man. Sometime, and especially now in this 21st century, we really got this idea that we're, we're teaching people that what's most important is that they be independent. You've got to be independent. You've got to be an independent man. You've got to be an independent woman. Well, was Adam independent? In a sense. Although, who was feeding him? Do the plans that God made. But could Adam have said, I'm my own man. I don't need another human being for my... But it wasn't good for him to be that way. So that, that's a lie when it says that the best thing that you could be is independent of other human beings. God is saying, no. The best thing is for you to be connected to other human beings and sacrifice for them. We love other people not because we need other people to love us, to, to help support us. We love other people because we need to love something. Otherwise, we just we can't fulfill that part of who we were. It's part of our design. Now, the other one is I think it's interesting to see that God's teaching in the garden. Because I got a question. Does God think that the dog is going to be a good companion for Adam? Or the hippopotamus? Or the, the sheep or the goat? So we can look back at that verse where it says, and God starts making all these animals and Adam's naming them. Like God's like, mm, I wonder what's going to work. Let's try a canary. Will a canary work? And Adam's like, nah, it's not right. Got something bigger? A hippopotamus. We got something smaller? A cat. We got something loyal? Here's a dog. You know, it's not quite like that. But what it is is God's teaching Adam. 
God's teaching Adam to show Adam that he has a need. Adam doesn't know he has a need because he's never seen a woman before. Or another human being. He doesn't know what he needs. He doesn't even necessarily know that he needs it until he starts seeing all these other things and starts thinking, you know, there's, there's something I... So God's even teaching in the garden. And I think it's important because I, there's a lesson here in the fact that a lot of times God allows us to feel the need so we can understand the magnitude of the grace when he answers it. I know, and this is... I'm going to use an example, but understand that the, the story of the Garden of Eden is not all about husbands and wives. It's not about man and woman, husbands and wives. It's not all about that. It's about humanity. So I say that, and then I'm going to use an example of kind of that coupling for a sense, but I'm just using it as an example. Uh, because so often, there will be people that will be really struggling because uh, there'll be an age in their life where they're really hoping, gosh, I wish God would just send the right man or the right woman in my life, and then everything will be great. I have, right? a, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, for starting, and of course I've heard Genesis quite a few times. So that was the reason God didn't create Adam and Eve at the same time, because Adam had to learn that there was another need. That's why the yes. animals first. Animals first, and as a matter of fact, it's so God knows it's not it's it's not good for Adam to be alone. Adam doesn't get known. So sometimes I'll hear those people say, "I wish God would just like send me a note when I was you know congr congratulations, you're six years old. Here's who the woman you're going to marry. How oh, fantastic! I know who I'm going to marry. Everything's good. But do you re recognize what you need in a partner at six years old? Oh, did I? <laughs> Maybe I should say eight. Or 10. Right? So often we think like that. Or 40. 45 or 60 or 80 or whatever the age is. We're like, oh, if only I... I. But the reality is so oftentimes God's got to lead us to know. Listen, at 18, I knew what I needed for a woman. And I told God repeatedly what it was supposed to be. That is not who God gave me. God gave me a wife that had strengths I didn't know I needed. By the time that Katie was put in my life, I recognized, oh, that's what I need. Maybe I'll use it. Okay, so that's a little too specific. I'll use a, a less general one. The best steak I've ever had, and actually it's a series of steaks. There was a season of my life where I had amazing steaks. Uh, it was in, while I was in Afghanistan. And what I do is, uh, in Helmand Province, uh, the, the British had had a shared base with the Marines. Uh, Camp Leatherneck was the Marine side. The British side was uh, Bastion. And what I do is every couple weeks I'd fly up. I had a couple hundred Marines up there. I'd go up there and I'd do the chapel thing. I'd you know, kiss babies, shake hands, do, the, do that thing. Pray for some people, do a Bible study, and then a Bible too. Uh, but then after I'd done with that, I'd walk from the, the Leatherneck side of the Bible, the, the base, uh, in, in the summer of Afghanistan, you know, the summer heat of Afghanistan, 120 Marine, bulletproof vestment, walk six miles to the British side of the base, where there, where they had, uh, where they had a steakhouse, and there they, I get a salad and a steak and a vanilla, vanilla shake with caramel on the inside, and it was amazing. And it was amazing, and I enjoyed the amazingness. And in my head, it's the best steaks I've ever had, the best shakes I've ever had. Now I got to tell you, probably it wasn't. But because of where it was at, because how long it had taken and all the work, I'd walk. You know, I was happy. Six miles, I'm going to walk six miles and go get it. And guess what happens after you eat that? You get to go back and walk back the other, right? You get to do all that. And you're like, yay. But, you know, it's 120 degrees. That's what I want to do. Or, you know, 40 pounds of body armor and boots and stuff. And, but I was excited about the whole thing. Because, you know, and I, I felt it. I understood the grace and the amazingness of the steak because of the situation. That, so in a sense, that became a, this amazing steakhouse. Well, that's what God's doing. And I hate to compare a woman to a steak. But that's kind of the, <laughs> that's kind of the deal, right? <laughs> so the Lord God caused the man to fall asleep into deep sleep. And the man slept, and the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs, and he closed up the opening. And then the, the Lord God made a woman out of the rib, and he... Uh, brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed. 
That's his response. His response is, wow! That's it. That is it. So that's what my, I was telling you. What God was doing was teaching him how to need. He didn't know he was looking for a woman. He didn't know he was looking for another human being until God had given him the hunger and then he answered it. At last, the man explained, and the, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was, she was taken from man. And this explains why the man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Now this lesson has a whole lot of ramifications. This is the beauty of the initial relationships that God's given us. But it's more than just this. Sometimes people look at this and say, well, this is our teaching on marriage. And is it a teaching on marriage? Yeah. yeah. But more than that. Remember, God doesn't say it's not good to, uh, for man to be alone because he can't be fruitful and multiply without a woman. That's not what he says. He just says it's not good for him to be alone. So the first thing is that this is an ending of his aloneness. His, he now has some human being that he can love. He has a neighbor to love. So there's that, that. So it's not only about families, but it is about families. I mean, it does elevate also a man and a woman. To, one will be will, to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. So it's, it shows the, the blessing that God has given in the garden for things like no more loneliness, right? Things for a husband and a wife. The idea of the creation of the family unit is a blessing of God. All of these things, the gift of children, how fantastic. All of that is right here in the garden. And this is the initial state. Everything, every child we have is a blessing. Every parent we have is a blessing. Every brother we have is a blessing. Every husband and wife, it's a blessing. It's all blessings. That was the start for Adam, and it's a start for us. But, act two. Adam failed, and we failed. All of those relationships that were great and wonderful, we miss up. Just like Adam, for pretty much the same reason. So chapter 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all animals uh, the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit of any tree in the garden? Is that what God said? No, that's not what God said. Well, Eve gives, her, gives him the right response. She says, uh, of course we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit in the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now the serpent... Um, Also, Satan, right? That's who we see as the serpent. He's a serpent, that little, that little wiry one. He's coming in here and he's doing something. And he does the same thing. By the way, he does the same thing here in the garden that he does today. <coughs> he preys upon our pride. He preys on our, our, our desire to elevate ourself above all things. To make ourselves God. But he does more than that. He comes in there and he attacks every one of those relationships that God has given him. He's talking to Eve, but is Adam there? She is in the people's lives. The, the text looks like Adam's right there. So he's already sawing between the two of them. Now, did God tell Eve not to eat of all the fruit or Adam? Adam. Adam. Interesting. Sawing the weed. It's sawing, 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 right? He's, he's doing that. More than that, he, he's breaking up the relationship that Adam has, so Adam and Eve have with the garden, have with, the, with God. He's, he's attacking all of those things. I mean, think about it. God said that this is how you will relate to this food. This is how you re relate to these things. This is how you relate to this. This is how you relate to this. And he's, he's made it so he first he seeks to divide the family unit, right? He still does that. Still seeks to destroy families. He looks at upsetting all the relationships, the relationships that people have with their environment. The relationships that people have with God. And ultimately, they attack the idea of whether or not God's good. 
That's all that was done. That was so sneaky. He attacked it all. Still does. Same sort of assaults. Same sort of attacks. The woman was convinced, and she saw that the tree was beautiful, and that she, uh, and the fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her, and she took some fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband. Now, we so often, we see, when we see this portrayed, we see this portrayed wrong, so often, because what we'll see is we'll see like Eve is the first person that sins, and we'll see Eve, and then, then because she sins, she, she brings her husband to sin. Is that what we're seeing described here? He's with her. But look at this. So she gave it to her husband. Who was with her? The first sin isn't Eve's sin. It's Adam's sin, by the way. And he ate it. So he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open. So what opened Eve's eyes was not the eating of the fruit. It was Adam's eating of the fruit. Think about that. See, the big sin was that Adam was the big sinner here. You think about this. He's standing with Eve. The serpent's telling Eve a lie. Adam, at this point, doesn't believe the serpent enough to work. He doesn't think that what the... Because if he believed what the serpent said was true, what would he have done? He would have eaten the fruit. So he didn't believe the serpent. Didn't really believe God either. So he's like, well, let's see if she's going to die. If she dies, then we're good. If she doesn't die, then it's on me. I mean, think about that. I mean, that's like having the great ranger take you out in the forest and say, these are mushrooms that you can eat, and these are mushrooms that you can't eat. These mushrooms are poisonous, these mushrooms aren't. And you're standing there with your, the woman you love, right? You said, oh, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And she goes, well, somebody else goes, well, the ranger doesn't know anything. Why don't you eat that poisonous one? If it's the woman you love, what are you going to do? Don't eat that mushroom. He doesn't do that. See, we, we so often, and a lot of times people will give Christianity an incorrect or Judaism or whatever to say they don't like women. They'll say, oh, they, they don't like women, and you see it because, you know, Eve is the, is the great evil person in the garden. No, that's not what that's saying. It says the great sin of the garden isn't com coming from Eve, it's coming from Adam. It comes from Adam. Romans 5.12 says, says that sin enters the world through one man, and death through sin. Adam, not Eve. Anyway, uh, continue on. He ate it too, and that moment their, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, and they sewed together fig leaves to cover themselves. Did the fig leaves cover the shame? No. We know that because as soon as God shows up, what do they do? They hide. It says right here, when the, Lord, the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden, so they hid. They hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? Now does he call them? Does he call man because he doesn't know where man is? It's like, Mongo, Polo, and he goes out. No, it's not like that. The man thinks that he can hide his shame from God. But that's not true. God knows. You can't just get dressed up and cover all those ugliness. You've got to be... God knows where you came from. He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid that I, uh, because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me. Who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. She's honest. She, she was deceived. She believed the serpent she ate it. Adam didn't believe the, the serpent and let his wife eat it. 
And then when she didn't die, then he, then he didn't believe God. So it's like it's a whole mangle of mangle of sin that Adam does. And then when he asks, he blames everybody. He blames everybody on the drama that he can think of. The woman that you gave, I'm blaming everybody. I blame her. No. Here in this great blame game, what we see is we see echoes and ripples of destruction. So when we see one mistake happening, then we see that kind of ride out and come back. And it's the same today. When I make a mistake, when I do something, when I violate a trust, when I step on somebody's toes, it creates a ripple and it goes out. And you know what? It never stops. It kind of it hits and it reflects on other people and it comes back. And, and then everybody here is, is always affected by the mistakes that I'm making or that they're making. And it's just these ripples are coming and going. And it's just, and I, I like to see them as uh, ripples or echoes of destruction just happening in creation. So Adam starts out with one sin and he continues to just kind of ride that wave. He turns that sin of disobedience into blaming Eve and blaming this. And you know what? It affects all of his relationships. But here's the, the good news. The good news is that we see in Act 3, we see God's promise of grace, healing, and forgiveness. So then the Lord God said to the serpent, so right here he's coming in and establishing justice. He's minimizing the, the, the ripples by punishing the sin. But then the Lord God said to the, the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild, who crawl on your belly, uh, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And you will cause, uh, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And you, he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now here's, here's the picture. Um, when they say the, the seed, they mean the seed of the earth. They say the offspring of woman. Uh, what they say is they say the seed of the woman is in the Hebrew. Now, when, do women have seed in Hebrew? No. So even here is a it's an interesting thing. It's a picture of of essentially a a human being coming from a woman, starting from a woman. It's a virgin birth. So right here in the judgment, in the judgment of right in the very beginning. God is not only giving them a judgment to answer some of those ripples, he's giving them a hope for healing. He's saying, and you know what? The serpent who's leading this rebellion, his rebellion, which will be at the will be battling the, the descendants of, the, of Christ or the followers of Christ, uh, it will end with the seed of the woman, with Jesus Christ, crushing Satan. He will, he will strike his head. But will it cost Jesus? cost him. Strike his heel. But what's great is that we see, even in judgment, we see God right there at the beginning giving grace. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen your pain in pregnancy and your pain when you give birth. And you will desire to control your husband and he will rule over you. It means that even in that relationship, that husband and wife relationship, things are going to be out of whack. Those ripples are going to run through those relationships. And the man says, uh, and, and to the man he says, since you listened to your wife and you ate the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you, and all your life you struggle to scratch a living from it, and it will grow thorns and thistles for you, uh, though you will eat of the grain, uh, though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until the return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to the dust you will return. So right there he's given this kind of, he's given, here's the punishment, here's what the ripples are going to do, but he's also given some hope in there. But first thing is he, he sets up, hey, this is the new new, new normal. These are the ripples that, are, that you cause. You cause these ripples are going to continue. All those relationships you had before, what did you have? The relationship with the garden, the way that you worship, all of those things got set on their ear. Sin mars all of our things. It mars our relationship with our loved one, with other people, with God, with, with our children, with our environment, with our view of labor, with the way that we worship, with the way that we view ourselves. All of these things are marred. These are all echoes of that sin. And we can blame Adam, but you know what? We're making the same ripples and echoes from here every time that we sin. And then Adam... Named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who lived. And the Lord God made clothing for them out of animal skins. An animal had to die to cover their shame. Their shame. 
So blood is shed to cover their shame, and it's supposed to be a lesson for them. And Adam said to his wife, then the Lord God said, look, the human being has become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take the fruit from the tree of life, and eat it? Then they will live forever. You know, does God want them not to live forever? What's the problem with them living forever right now? The problem with them living forever right here is that they're forever in that fallen state. When Paul is saying, I know what the right thing is to do, but I can't seem to do it. Right? Every day I get up, I know the right thing, and I, I still do the wrong thing. And he says, who will free me from the body of sin and death? Adam and Eve are in the bodies of sin and death right now. They would be forever trapped in this had they took the, the, fruit, of the, the, tree, the fruit from the tree of life. So God's saying, no, we don't want that to happen because we have to allow for death so that the sin can be paid and the person can have a new life. Does that make sense? It's the difference between whether or not I'm going to take this funky body to heaven or whether or not we're new in the sense of having a new body too. A new nature. Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden and he sent Adam out of, to cultivate the ground for which uh, he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden uh, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard uh, the way to the Tree of Life. And what we're supposed to see, we're supposed to see kind of that same establishing of, of that that I talked about earlier. This is where we... We first see that kind of new normal. But what God has done is he's, he's now allowed Adam a way, a way forward, a new set of relationships, a new way of moving forward and being healthy. So he's shown his love and his mercy. He institutes a sacrifice system. That's what he's done. He said, okay, vision, because we messed up in the garden, but there's a way, and it's pointing to Jesus Christ. In the prophecy of Jesus Christ, he gives to, uh, to Eve and all of that, you see that everything's pointing back toward, hey, there's a way to get back to a right relationship. So he blesses, he blesses, even, even through, think about this, even through banishment and death, God is blessing Adam. By taking him out of the garden, he can't accidentally, accidentally, eat the tree, the, the fruit of life. So he's going over there, he's like, okay, come back here and work the land and do these things and and he's giving away, and that's where Adam gets to be. Have, and you see, as the story goes on, he has kids, and things start happening for him. He has new relationships are established. Um, and then finally, he provides a means for the man to start again. Um, and then we see an epilogue. And I want to include this in here because what we see in all this is we see that those, the, the, the echo of what happened in Adam and his selfishness and his relationship, it carries through to his son and sons. And if we move it down, it keeps going all the way thousands of years later to us. So looking right here, it says, uh, when it was time for the harvest, uh, Cain presented, so Cain and Abel are his two sons, Cain presented some of his crops to the Lord God. So now, was crops what we were supposed to present to the Lord God? No. How do we know? Well, God's going to say it here in a second, but what did it do? Was the, was the fig leaves sufficient to cover the shame? No. An animal had to be slain. So that was the pattern that God had set. Abel also brought a gift, the best portion of the uh, portions of the firstborn lands of his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but did not accept Cain and his gift. Now I got upset because I used to think of this this is like tithing. I'm like, well, he's a farmer. If he does 10% of what he does, then he's given 10% of his food. That should be good. Because I'm thinking of it like a dollar or something. Like writing a check to pay for your sin. Do we write checks to pay for sin? No. We're supposed to think of life as the payment of sin. We're supposed to think blood when it comes to that. Jesus didn't write a check. He may have owned the cattle on a thousand hills. He didn't write a check for it. He didn't say, oh, let me write a check then for man's salvation. Had to be blood. This made Cain angry and he looked dejected. 
Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. In other words, he, he knew what was right, he just didn't do it. But if you refuse to do what's right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must uh, subdue it and be its mastery. God gives them a warning, right? But those ripples and echoes are going through there. And when it comes to Cain, Cain has the ability to, to listen and listen to God. But instead, he chooses to ride the ripple. God tells him something. Instead of listening to God, he just gets more angry. One day, Cain suggests to his brother, let's go out in the field. And while they're out in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, when he killed him. And afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, where's your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I bro my brother's keeper? Is he his brother's keeper? Well, relationships are a gift, and yes. But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you will be cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer would the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. And he, he really gives them that kind of but what we're supposed to see is that Cain does deny the relationships. He causes problems. You know what? That denial poisons his other relationships. And what we're supposed to see in that story also is today. Today, do, do we have tendencies to hate our brothers? Do we have ten tendencies to do these? Yes. So that story of Adam and Eve wasn't ended in the garden. It didn't end with Adam and Eve. Those relationships, those mistakes are still happening today. And we have choices to make. We have the Cain choice. We have the Abel choice. Which way are we going to go? Are we going to respond to God and do things the way God would have us do as Abel did? Or as Cain? Are we going to choose that? Are we going to choose the right? So the, the questions for us, I mean, there, there's a multitude of them. But where are we going to go with our relationships? And it's, it's something for us to recognize. Because the mistakes in our past, they're going to mark, they have the potential to, to uh, create ripples of destruction in, in, in all of our relationships. Our relationships with our, our, our families, our relationships with our, our environment, everything. It's all there. So the question is, what do you need to do to make your relationships right where you are? Where do you need to go to submit and point back to that? And this right now, is it a time for you to resubmit to that relationship with God? Is God telling you right now to resist whatever you have been not resisting? And so often when we talk about riding the wave, we look at that kind of the black of picture where it says, look at where God's, what God's doing and ride the wave of what God's doing and that kind of picture of, that's amazingness. Well, you know what? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we're riding the wrong kind of waves. Somebody does something to make us mad and we feed onto that madness and we get our boogie board and we ride that evil to more destruction. Don't we? Somebody says something mean to us, we say it mean, to, is it time for us to get off? Off that way. Is it time to look back at the labor and say, hey, where, where's our view right? Where's it wrong? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh my God, we thank you that, that you have not given up on us. That the story doesn't end with, and Rick sent his first time and was zapped. We thank you that the story goes, and when Rick realized how silly he was, how, how much of the damage he made in his relationship, Rick was able to turn, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ, recognize that Jesus died for him, was raised from the dead, accept Jesus' lordship of his life, and was made a new creature. Now certainly on this side of, on this side of eternity, I, I, I bring with me um, a struggle that I constantly have, and we all do. We all bring that struggle between what we ought to do and what we do. But we thank you, Lord, that the church, that your love, that your empowerment by the Holy Spirit gives us a foretaste of what, what that true relationship will one day be. Lord, I hand over to you every relationship I have, everything, the way that I relate to uh, the things I possess, the the way that I relate to the things that have been entrusted to me, the way that I relate to my children, to my parents, to my loved ones, to my church members, to my the strangers on the street, I lay all of those 
as sacred gifts down to you, Lord. Lord, help me. So often I'm riding the wrong waves in the wrong direction. Help me ride the wave of your Holy Spirit moving through this world. May I be a force of healing and restoration instead of one of destruction. May I listen to you, Lord, and not that, not that serpent that's been so often feeding, feeding my selfish appetites or feeding my, my desire to, to be the God of the universe. May I, may I stand strong against that and stand instead uh, on the rock that is Jesus Christ and say, he's, the, he's my rock. Lord, help me. Help me live in my relationships and show love. Where people have let me down, may I be able to love them as Jesus did. May I be able to as easily say, help me, Father, for they forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Help me understand that. Help me love people when they hate me. Help me pray for people that, that, that seem to think they're my enemy. Lord, may all of our relationships look like they ought to. I thank you for this. I pray that you guide us as we walk forward. I pray that you continue to use us as salt and light in this world. And I thank you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.